Welcome back to another episode of Talk and Block. I am Velociraptor, and today I am joined by Nicholas Majenten Shinhan Taylor in the virtual flesh. We got video of him today. How you doing, Nick? I'm doing good, uh, real good. You know, um, good. winter's clearing up. Uh, you know, I live in Sweden, so winter isn't great. Let's put it that way. So, uh, you know, feeling some sunlight coming in here. Um, Feeling life I can identify. Yeah, yeah. I live so, in Arizona. It feels like we're also like kind of entering a golden age. A <laughs> golden age, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's actually what we're here to talk about today. <laughs> Nick was talking to me recently about how the fighting game community has gone through these golden ages, or maybe has appeared to go through some golden ages where we have just classic after classic that come out maybe in the span of a few years, and then stuff seems to appear apparently die in a fiery fiery terrible death only to a few years later like the phoenix come bursting forth through the ashes with another string of classics and we wanted to look a little bit closer at this and kind of make some sense of it or see are there patterns or are there not and uh, yeah so that's the gist of it pretty pretty open so i'll turn it over to you nick what do you think about golden ages and fighting games where do you want to start start at the beginning uh i think uh Fighting games in general have obviously never gone away. They've been active the entire time, but um, fighting games really kicked off back in 91, right? With Street Fighter 2, that was the huge seller, and it led to all these fighting games coming out. Uh, like, just shortly mm -hmm. after Fatal Fury, and that was like the start of SNK. Uh, and then, you know, we got Virtua Fighter, we got Tech, and like the 3D fighting games started coming out. We had all these Capcom franchises. Like, back then, this was like before they made Resident Evil, Capcom was known Mortal as... Combat. Yeah, Mortal Kombat, of course, um, on the US side. Uh, but like Capcom were known specifically as a fighting game developer for a while there. Uh -huh. uh, until they started like... I mean, they did other stuff as well. But uh, they kind of got a different mainstream view around the late 90s with Resident Evil and stuff. But for a while, they were like, oh, they're the fighting game company. Because, you know, they made tons of Street Fighter, of course. Uh, and then they made, you know, Darkstalker, Cyberbot, Star Gladiator. Like, they just kept pumping out new fighting game IPs. And then, you know, when the X-Men stuff was big at the end of 90s, they were like, oh, X-Men vs. Street Fighter into Marvel vs. Capcom. And, you know, fighting games were uh -huh. everywhere. And I think this first golden age, which started with Street Fighter 2, of course, was yeah. the arcade age, right? Everyone was playing in arcades. That was the thing. And that became, like, the social hangout spot. Probably more so in Japan than elsewhere. Uh, over here in Sweden, we didn't really have arcades. So here it was more like on the SNES and the PlayStation. But I know uh, in America, you guys had a lot of arcades at that time. I one of, the, one of the fondest memories I have with my dad is we would walk down to Circle K, which is a little gas station yeah. area. And they had a Street Fighter 2, not quite super turbo, but it was the the new challengers with mm -hmm. T-Hawk and Fei Long and Kami when they were first introduced. And, uh, and and I would get a quarter and I'd get to play and I'd usually lose to T-Hawk round or first game. Yeah, <laughs> Every so often, every so often. Yeah. I'd get them and I'd get all the way to Fei Long and then I'd lose. But, you know... <laughs> Yeah. Now, uh, around here, we mostly had that in the, like, amusement parks. So, you know, when you had this, like, summer outing and you were going, I wasn't really into roller coasters, so I would go to the arcade and I would be like, what do they have here? Oh, Tekken Free? I'm up for it, you know? I want to play this. Um, so the arcade age, obviously, big in the 90s, huge boom for fighting games. And everyone talks about that as the golden era. Everyone remembers that. I would say mm -hmm. it probably went from, like... 91 to 97 somewhere around there that's kind of the um what would you say if like what happened in 97 that that maybe stopped it um by the way that's the year that mace the dark age came out just want to shout that out so <laughs> maybe I mean, that's your answer no 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 it's not um i don't think there ever was really a dark age i just think the golden age can't last forever that's more how i see it and I think what happened was arcades started becoming less and less popular. So mm -hmm. it shifted to more of a home gaming thing. And it did it wasn't a social thing anymore in the same way that the arcade had been. So it was less in your face. Because uh, okay. it's pretty common that people say, you know, oh, there was a dark age, you know, until Street Fighter 4, between Street Fighter 3 and 4. And that may mm -hmm. be true for Street Fighter. That wasn't true for fighting games. Because uh, during that time, Tekken was popping off. They got Tekken 5. Uh, probably the most beloved competitive entry in the series. Soul Calibur was just knocking it out of the park, game after game after game. Um, you know, Soul Calibur 2 came out then, which was the biggest one. 
Um, the Mortal Kombat's were going through the 3D era, which might not have been the best era yeah. for Mortal Kombat, but it was still going, and it still was interesting, yeah. and it was still doing the Mortal Kombat thing. The things that Mortal Kombat's good at, it was still mm -hmm. doing that. It still had its fan base, and it still kept... It never went poorly, you know? They were still selling well during that entire time. Uh, yeah. So you had all this stuff going on, even though, you know, Street Fighter wasn't quite around, because Street Fighter 3... Had, I think Street Fighter 3 was very focused on the arcade setting when it came out. Because mm. you never got a good console port of it. Uh, you could play it on the Dreamcast, but it wasn't like arcade perfect. And I think that's where Capcom kind of faltered. They thought the arcade age would continue going. Because you had the same issue with Capcom vs. SNK2 and Marvel's Capcom 2. They were very arcade oriented, but arcades were kind of going away. You know, not entirely, but they were diminishing. Uh, so I think when people talk about like, oh, that was a dark age, it's more of a thing like arcades were falling off. That doesn't mean that fighting games necessarily were, even though Capcom might have pivoted a little bit too late at that point, right? So, okay, fair enough, because I, I have always talked about it as like that was a darker period. Maybe it's darker than a golden age. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, it doesn't depend on, let's say, Capcom. Well, let me put it to you this way. When Capcom's doing well, a lot more eyes are on the fighting game community in general. When Tekken or Mortal Kombat are doing well, it's kind of like, yeah, it still stays within the niche, but it feels like when Capcom, you know, is producing a new Street Fighter that's really successful or some Marvel versus Capcom even that, that are really successful, that's when all the other games benefit. But I, I'm, I might say that when these other titles, when these other franchises are doing well, it doesn't necessarily benefit the other fighting game fighting games like when Capcom is doing well. Is that fair to say or no? For 2D fighters, I can agree with you. But I think 3D fighters are in a different space. And I think, honestly, for 3D fighters, that was probably the golden era. Because Virtua Fighter 4 is a very beloved game, and it came um, around during this so-called Dark Age, right? Yeah, 2001. Yeah, and then I think it's 2005 for Tekken 5, which was really big. Soul Calibur 2 and 3 both came out during this period. Like, 3D fighting games were doing really well. And as you mentioned, Mortal Kombat at the time was 3D. And uh, especially in retrospect, those games might not be the most popular Mortal Kombat games, but the series was still running, it was still going. So I think it was more the fact that Capcom didn't go 3D and they didn't shift from arcades, and that made the perception at the time different i don't think they necessarily took like huge missteps in that regard but i think it's more like free like i think you remember yourself around like early 2000s 3d mania was huge like if something yeah. is, like 2d is not a thing anymore everyone was just like no it has to be 3d and i think that's also part of it uh because capcom didn't sure. do much in that area i think star gladiator was 3d but i think that's about it because when I think about it, I go, okay, so Street Fighter 2 comes out and it just gets so much attention and it spawns copycats and, and all that. And, yeah. and like Mortal Kombat comes out the next year and, and whatnot. And I, it was inspiring for the entire genre. But that's Street Fighter 2. Maybe that's its own case. But then you come out to, uh, and then Street Fighter 3 happens. We're talking about that, that time. Maybe that wasn't turning the lights off completely. But when you get to Street Fighter 4, that sends us into a whole new age of everybody's benefiting and then like street fighter 4 plus mvc3 yeah. and that's both capcom and now i'm suddenly paying attention to the franchises that even that i don't pay attention to as an individual and i think a lot of others too is like i'm like oh when's the new mortal kombat coming out oh there's sure. the you know tech and tag oh they're at tournament two tech and tag two at that <laughs> so i i'm starting to pay attention and maybe that's just because i'm more of a capcom guy but it seems like when when capcom pops off and does really well and it is headlining tournaments and the new street fighters out people will go like it in at least the tournament scene, for instance, yeah. people will go to play that game, mm -hmm. but then they'll also play a lot of other games. And so then the other games get surges as well. I, and it feels like that doesn't necessarily happen when a new Tekken comes out even. And that would be maybe the second biggest competitor there. I think that's fair to an extent, but I need to raise another point to you. We talked mm -hmm. about the first Golden Age and what we said was it was the arcades. It was social. You work in you talked about the Circle K, that was specifically Street Fighter 2, right? But if you walk into an arcade to play Street mm -hmm. Fighter 2, you're going to see these other games. You're going to see Tekken 3, you're going to see Darkstalkers, you're going to see all this stuff. So maybe the line is too long at Street Fighter 2. Maybe you want to go check out these other games, right? They're mm -hmm. all around you, right? Sure. 
that wasn't happening in the between era, but with Street Fighter 4, I think we went into the second golden age because online. Now, it was basically an arcade on your console because you were always online and it became this social thing again that it wasn't really before because you were just playing with your homies at, at home, right? Now you were actually having the arcade feeling of that. Like, I'm going out, I'm playing with these people, a bunch of stuff is happening. And because of that, you're also interacting with other games because everything is around you now since it's like online discourse, streams started becoming a thing, obviously tournaments, right? Um, so all of these things exist together in the same sense that mm -hmm. they did during the arcade days. I think that's a big part of it. And I do agree. It was a second golden age. You had uh, Street Fighter 4, Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Tekken was still, you know, popping off. Mortal Kombat 9 was MK9, a huge... MK9, yeah, yeah. Huge resurgence for the series. Um, King of Fighters 13... 13 is one of the eyes. best. Yeah. Right? A lot of people... It's, it's very popular with people who don't normally like KOF. And I think that speaks a lot to the way they approached it with the visuals. They were like, hey, look, guys. 3D was all the rage for a while now, but 2D can be really cool too. And I think everyone kind of saw 13 was like, damn, yeah, that is really cool. And they did these super mm. long flashy combos and everything, right? Uh, obviously, you know, Guilty Gear came back during this as well uh, with Exert, because Guilty Gear was gone for a while uh, and they made Blaze Blue, which still kept going as well. So you had all this stuff happening. Everything was going well. And as you said, like, I think Street Fighter 4 is definitely a big part of why everything went well. But I think it's like a part of a bigger picture. I don't think Street Fighter 4 is the whole picture. I think it's the advent of online. And obviously, in retrospect, the online wasn't great, right? It wasn't yeah. great. But no, but it but it was available yeah. when it really wasn't, at least not to that degree. Exactly. Before it existed, uh, and in the same way that the arcade was like, if you walk in walked into the arcade, you were gonna play with someone. It wasn't gonna be empty. Uh, and then online, same thing. You're going to play with someone. Whereas in the between period, which I still don't want to call a dark age, you were playing okay. with your homies at home. There's not going to be a random person you're playing against because it doesn't work that way. There's not going to be random strangers in your home. At least I hope not, right? Uh, so it's a different type of thing. That doesn't mean that fighting games were necessarily going poorly. It just meant that this social outlet wasn't as prominent. So, so are you saying that Street Fighter uh, 4 comes out and it just happens to be when online is at a point where it opens this door and it was just lucky that it was the one that, that did it? Because to, I think of it like mm -hmm. Capcom is the one that opens these doors to like the, the next like big thing for fighting games and it does street fighter 2 and then uh, with street fighter 4 it, it brings the online aspect and then a whole lot else beyond but if online is the big thing that revitalizes the entire genre it's like well but street fighter 4 was maybe not the first to do it but the first big notable one to do it and again it's like capcom opens these giant doors or pathways and then everybody else follows through them do you think like or do we have an example where somebody else opens a giant door and everybody else follows through like that i do not think it was lucky i think it was calculated but at the same time, if we say that, you know, Ono's pitch for Street Fighter 4 gets rejected, that age is still going to come because Xbox Live was massive at the time. Uh, at first, people were like, wait, Microsoft is like asking money to play games online? What are you talking about? But they actually worked quite well. And obviously, a very big part of that was um, it wasn't even particularly big in my neck of the woods. But for you, when I say this, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Halo, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, Halo was massive. And that was largely because they went online with everything. And everyone was like, damn, this experience is amazing. Because a lot of people weren't PC gamers back then. Uh, you know, I, I played PC when I was a kid. So online gaming was, you know, I was used to it. But for a lot of people, they just played on their console. And online gaming became a thing. And Microsoft pushed that very heavily and kind of forced Sony and Nintendo to, you know, embrace online to an extent as well. Um so online was going to happen no matter what and street fighter returning at that time and you know pushing a lot of nostalgia by having the street fighter 2 characters but also doing a lot of new things and kind of hitting this perfect sweet spot with you know it's pretty accessible and not that difficult 
Except it's really difficult once you actually get into it. Uh, you know, sure. scratching both of those itches. So I think it wasn't luck. It was very calculated and it was very well executed. But it would have happened anyway, although not maybe to the same extent. Because online was going to happen. Okay, so let me ask you this. Say Street Fighter 4 doesn't happen, or at least doesn't happen in, uh, in the way it happened, right? Does Evo explode like it did? Because I feel like Street Fighter 4 was uh, a huge, huge non-negotiable reason as to what propelled Evo from being what we remember with like Battle by the Bay and such yeah. into a whole new era. And then when Street Fighter 5 came out, we'll talk about that awesome game here i'm sure <laughs> soon uh but and when street fighter 5 came out that was where kind of where evo got to make another huge jump and evo is not the entire picture but that's a really relevant part of it i feel like street fighter has been the thing that's allowed evo to level up into new yeah. chapters and and pass through new uh, mile markers I think it's the same thing there. It's a part of the picture, but it's not the whole picture. Would it have happened that way, though? Like, would would Evo be where it is? Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be where it is now, but, like, would it be similar to where it is now? Or would it still kind of be back in, like, you know, maybe just ballrooms at it, this point? It, it, or maybe it not be, even ballrooms? It would be similar because of streaming. Street Fighter 4 or not, streaming was going to become gigantic. And if game streaming is gigantic, events are going to be gigantic. Look at speedrunning. Street Fighter has nothing to do with speedrunning. Probably like, I don't know, about 10 years ago. Yeah, I think like 10 years ago. If you look at like awesome games done quick 10 years ago, you can count the people in the room. It's like mm -hmm. 20 people max watching these runs because it's it's in like a closet almost. Yeah. That's not the case anymore because streaming became massive. And that started around Street Fighter Force time, like a few years after. That's going to happen no matter what. And yeah, I think Street Fighter 4 propelled this way stronger, and I don't think EVO would be as big, but I think it would be similar. Because these trends were going to happen no matter what, and other fighting game developers weren't just doing it because Street Fighter was doing it, they were doing it because it was the natural progression for their games. Street Fighter just happened to catch a lot more eyes because they were very smart about how they did it. It was a good game, a lot of people came into the scene with it, I'm pretty sure you did, right? Yep. Yeah. So I'm not trying to downplay Street Fighter 4 in any way. I just think it's a part of the picture. It's not the entire picture. All right. Well, OK, so moving beyond that, what happens after uh, Street Fighter 4? <laughs> what happens after Street Fighter 4? Um, your favorite game came out, right? Yeah. Is this one of the Skullgirls that you're talking about? Or uh, the, the new... <laughs> Street Fighter 5? Big fat, aren't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> So Street Fighter V obviously comes out. Uh, it's uh, it gets a mixed reception, and I think this is it's very nice, <laughs> very nice way to put it. I think this is a place where people might, you know, go, "Oh, it was a dark age again," and I can s I, I don't even think it's fair to say that it was a dark age for Street Fighter, even though I don't really like Street Fighter V. I tried playing it for I think three years, uh, never really gelled with it. Uh, it still got content the entire time. It still had events and Capcom actually like trailblazed with the Pro Tour format Which they have kind of moved away from now while other companies are still doing it, which is interesting But they were trailblazers with that. So I think fighting games were still going strong in that sense um, The move towards esports was like starting to happen But I also think we got a huge game changer in Dragon Ball Fighters um, Massive game that brought insane amounts of new players into it because it's a huge IP and it was coupled with, you know, Arxis uh, development that did like amazing visuals, but it was also quite accessible, even though it had some really like flashy and extensive stuff that, you know, newer players aren't going to be able to do, but they can see the pro players do it and it's like, whoa, this is amazing. And it's fallen off now, obviously. Uh, it, it's had some issues lately, even uh, with the whole, you know, I'm not going to put any footage yeah. or stuff up because we might get a we might get in trouble on YouTube. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. <laughs> Shout out to Tyrant. Yeah. Um, no, but I think people are going to look back in a few years, and I don't I don't think people really realize right now how big the impact of Rainbow Fighters was on the FGC. But they're gonna when you look back later, you're actually going to realize, damn, yeah, this was actually like a huge deal. 
Um, yeah, yeah, but let me let me let me toot the Capcom horn in a weird anti way almost here though. But a lot of the success of Dragon Ball Fighters was one because it was a good game and because it was an IP that everyone absolutely loved yeah. already. But it was also there to take advantage of a big fat misstep and a vacuum that existed because of Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite shitting the bed. Sure. Uh, if we say that Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite would have been a success, let's say it was like Marvel 3 levels of success, I still think Dragon Ball Fighters would outpace it, but they would be able to exist together. And it would have flourished more for everyone, right? And Dragon Ball Fighters probably wouldn't have been as successful as it was because they would be cannibalizing each other somewhat, right? Mm -hmm. So I do agree. But I don't think that, like, Dragon Ball Fighters succeeded because of that. I think that's minimalizing what Dragon Ball Fighters did. But I do agree. Uh, the timing was insanely <laughs> fortuitous uh, for that release. Uh, I don't think it could have come a better time. And, uh, you know, just since we're talking about Dragon Ball, you said it was a very beloved IP. Dragon Ball shirt right here. Got Shenron over here. So, R.I.P. You know. Toyama. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, okay, I want to I want to back up a little bit though because you mentioned that Street Fighter Five and hey, if we lump this in with also um, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, you said some people regard it as a dark age or or, or might talk about it as such. Can you? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean that? Because like yeah, the games are kind of crap for sure, but they were enough to keep the franchises above water. And then yeah, we saw all the success on the esports side and the pro tour and and numbers were bigger than ever. Uh, just because the momentum was so strong, and maybe that's due to a lot of the other games that had also carried that momentum forward yeah. after the boom that came from, uh, you know, post Street Fighter Four. Yeah. Uh, but like, when when you say Dark Age, what do you, what do you mean there? And how much do you think that that's a Dark Age? I don't think it's a Dark Age. Um, I like I said, I didn't want to use that for the previous era we talked about. I wouldn't use it for this area either. But okay, it's it's a sentiment I definitely have seen, and I think most people have seen because. Street Fighter V got a lot of shit, and at least half of it deservedly so, because uh, there were a lot of issues uh, with that game, especially when it came out. Um, and, you know, when that negativity is all that surrounds a game, where's the motivation as a competitor, as a player, as a fan, mm -hmm. to engage, right? And it wasn't just Street Fighter V, like, Tekken 7 came a while after, and it did really, really well. It exceeded their expectations and started popping up. But Tekken Tag Tournament 2 did not do very well. And that was, like, where Tekken was at when Street Fighter V came out. So Tekken was also in a kind of a dark spot, because Tekken Tag 2 had failed to meet expectations. So the initial release of Tekken 7 in arcades, uh, which was out then, was very limited. It had, like, 10 characters. You know, Jin wasn't even there. Um, the budget was low. Harada explicitly said, like, yeah, our budget is way lower than it was in Tekken Tag 2 because, you know, it didn't do well enough. Um, right. So a lot of that stuff was looking... I, I don't want to say it was looking grim, but it was, like, more muted, right? So stuff wasn't as glorious as it had been, and you were inevitably... I, I think it's the same thing. You're looking back with rose tinted glasses. Like, you were looking at the arcade before, and you were like, oh, you know... Now it's a dark age because that golden age is gone. And that's the same thing here. Like, everyone loved Street Fighter 4. Street Fighter 5, not necessarily the case. So people were like, oh, so then it's a dark age, right? Because the golden it's age... It's a darker isn't age than before, yeah. yeah. They're looking and, back and at what happened and we're like, yeah, it's not like that anymore. This is a dark age. I gotta say, too, uh, to shout out, at least since we're talking timelines here and, and progressions, that Street Fighter 4 happens and there's a lot of momentum. Street Fighter Cross Tekken, whether you like the game or not, does not do well, and I think they sunk a lot of resources and a lot of the momentum that was coming off of Street Fighter 4 yeah. and, and other games went for as as far as Capcom goes into Cross Tekken. That doesn't do well, and, and uh, as far as the Matt McMuscles video that talks about this, he says that uh, the the like Capcom had their hands a little more tied going into Street Fighter V because they had sunk so much into Street Fighter Cross Tekken and, and lost so much that they had to do the Sony deal right yeah. and things like that and it felt like stuff was really rushed and and they just didn't have enough resources to make that game what it needed to be um, for at least like the first couple of years that it was and then it's arguable after that but I I, I do think that that's relevant to this discussion right now like the Street Fighter Cross Tekken's uh, place on the timeline and performance is definitely something you got to talk about a little bit sure um i personally think that street fighter x tekken became a good game but 
That was like a year after, after. everyone was done. After everyone was yeah. gone. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Everyone was already gone when it became a good game. I think it's a great game now, but nobody was left. Okay, that's a bit exaggerating, but most of the people were gone by that point. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is unfortunate, because, you know, if it had released in that state, I think it would have done great. Because the hype was there for the game. It was very hyped. And then it just kind of fizzled. And I think this is also something uh, worth talking about, like, you know, trends with the game industry at large, is that game development is a lot more expensive. It became a lot more expensive, especially during that era. So a flop like that, it didn't even flop that hard, like, commercially. It was just that it didn't have the sustained um, growth that they were hoping, you know, that they could keep supporting it for years, etc. Um, that kind of stuff can actually, like... Okay, Capcom is really big, so I don't think it was a risk in that sense for Capcom. But that kind of stuff can kill the studio in today's landscape and even 10 years ago. Back in the arcade days, you were not going to die as a company because one of your games underperformed. Like, that was not a thing. They weren't nearly as expensive to make. Mm -hmm. Now they're way more expensive, so that did give them a huge hit. The same way the Tekken Tag Tournament 2 did for Bandai Namco, and you know, uh, I'm pretty sure King of Fighters 13 also did for SNK because uh, doing those sprites was very expensive. That's why they went 3D with King of Fighters 14 later because uh, they can't support something like that. It's way too expensive for the return they're getting, and <clears throat> obviously that is going to have an effect on everything because then you also have to be more safe in what you do. You can't take as many risks. You can't do as many projects. You know, even uh, I think it was around Cross Tekken's release or shortly after that we had this, you know, Dark Stalkers are not dead teaser from Ono that never went anywhere because they can't take that risk. It doesn't. It's yep. it's not viable. Uh, speaking of chain reactions, and this is on an even like like maybe once farther removed back uh, point of view, but I, I I can't help think that. Street Fighter uh, Cross Tekken comes out. It, it has the effect that it does on um, st uh, like on Street Fighter Five, and so then Street Fighter Five is announced to be exclusively on PlayStation Five. Right. Or, I'm sorry, PlayStation Four, but on PlayStation and not on Xbox. And everybody was playing on Xbox, and that meant like I got Marvel vs. Capcom because it was a big thing because it was available on Xbox, even though I didn't end up playing it very much. But I would I would get these other games just because you know I could, yeah. uh, being a Street Fighter Four player. Uh, but that comes out, and and so now you see a bunch of people have to make the decision. Well, when I get the new console, am I going to get PlayStation Four or am I going to get um, the new Xbox uh, One? Right? And people went with PlayStation Four for Street Fighter V, which meant that there not as many people were going to play on the Xbox exclusive Killer Instinct 2013. Yeah. That was a little bit beforehand, but I think that Killer Instinct, because everyone talks about the game like it was it was so good, it had so many things, like they were so in tune with what the community wanted. The way they were communicating, uh, communicating with everybody is how people do it now, at least like NRS, and they're very successful with their combat cast. Uh, Killer Instinct, Iron Galaxy, those guys were doing that you know way before. They were all doing I feel like they were also doing rollback netcode. They were doing seasons. They uh, knew what people wanted, yeah. right? They they set so many uh, uh, standards that we we do now. The only thing is they're not really around at the moment because people didn't play as much. But I feel like if uh, if if it wasn't that you had to have one or the other console, so many people aren't going to get both consoles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Street Fighter Five being exclusive, people are like, well, I'm a Street Fighter player. I have all this momentum from four and such. I, I gotta I gotta go where that's at. That at least was my story, and I think a lot of stories around me. I think Killer Instinct could have done better if people weren't forced to make that decision. Absolutely. Um... So another ripple effect of of yeah. how again Capcom's performance can affect yeah. others because Capcom had no choice. They needed the Sony mm -hmm. money. Like the. the I've had this, I remember like back when people were arguing whether Street Fighter V was successful or not, I always heard people say like, oh yeah, and it would have sold this many more million if it was on Xbox. I was like, but that's not a reality that exists. They wouldn't have been able to release the game at all if it was going to be on Xbox because then they don't get the Sony money so they can't develop the game. Like that's, mm -hmm. it just doesn't exist, this reality you're talking about. And I guess that's, as you said, it's like a ripple effect uh, in that regard that it also affected something like Killer Instinct because Killer Instinct set the trend for so many different things uh, that are now commonplace in fighting games and uh, everyone talks about it fondly, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah.
So 2016, 2017, 2018 roll by, and now we're starting to get into whatever our modern time is. Mm. And I think I would be, I would start to call this a golden age. I think Street Fighter VI, I don't know that it's the best Street Fighter of all time, that it's, it's too early to see that or to say that, but I think it's the most well executed and and it should be because it's got you know some 35 years of, of other games and experiments to be built on and and people are paying attention like crazy so it should be but uh then i look at like mortal kombat 1 that's not a golden age kind of title and although tekken 8 came out with so much momentum like was it arslan ash that just tweeted a couple of days ago and, and this is kind of more representative of, of the bigger community but someone like arslan ash saying this you know, it's all just kind of scrubby, heat-based stuff, and yeah. and like you know the the microtransactions and and just pointing out all the negatives and like there feels like there's some negative energy going on around Tekken Eight. Now it's mm. super early, but what kind of age are we in right now? I think we're in a new golden age. Um, I I I think Mortal Kombat One is not in a new golden age. I think that game has a lot of issues that you know are rightfully pointed out, and I don't know. I think it, in general, there's just trouble with Warner Brothers, right? Because Warner Brothers mm -hmm. has been kind of struggling in a lot of areas lately. Um, I, I don't want to speculate too much, but I think it's kind of that type of issue. I think there's a lot of like corporate meddling that just isn't vibing with what they need to do with the game. Uh, so for Mortal Kombat 1, I think that's like, you know, it could turn around, right? And I hope it mm -hmm. does. But uh, I agree, it's not representative of Golden Age, but I don't think one rotten apple is gonna like sour the entire bunch in that regard right so uh street fighter 6 extremely good game very well received a lot of people love the game uh tekken 8 amazing launch was very well received uh you definitely have this pushback that you've been talking about but i need to highlight something here that some people may not be aware of i think most people who play mm -hmm. tekken are fully aware of it which is that every tekken title before tekken 8 uh, besides revolution i think was released in arcades first and Every first version of Tekken, as in the one that's the, the ones that were in arcade, is janky as all hell. There is a crazy amount of stuff that just should not be in the game. And by the time we get it on console, all that stuff is gone. Now it's like, and that's why people are like, oh, you know, Tekken 7 was so good when that came out. Yeah, but it was in arcades two years earlier. And if you played that version, you wouldn't be saying that. So the fact that they didn't have an arcade release this time and they're releasing it uh, to the public immediately means that there are a lot of kinks that need to be ironed out. And I think they will be because we are in a patching age. Um, and, you know, they knocked out our park with their pro tour. They announced, you know, uh, full offline spread. You know, they do the dojo system like um, they have the best tour in um, as far as format goes. They have the best tour in the FGC, in my opinion. Uh, so yeah, Tekken 8 has issues, absolutely. Will those issues be addressed? I believe so. Um, so you have Street Fighter 6 doing really well. Tekken 8, you know, despite some grievances right now, still doing well. Uh, Mortal Kombat 1, okay, I'm gonna... <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna <laughs> plead the fifth on that one. Uh, but then... That Grand Blue uh, Fantasy versus Rising, I know you're a big fan of that I, one. I'm not gonna comment on that. Uh, and then we have... Uh, I, I will say it, it has a good amount of uh, influence at tournaments, so you know that's good for it. Uh, Strive is still kicking, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, King of Fighters 15 is actually doing really well as well, you know, at tournaments and everything. It had two seasons so far. Uh, probably going to get more. We had the World Finals just recently, amazing showing. Um, well, and speaking of SNK, big announcement recently. Yep. Uh, and that's kind of another thing. Um, when we're talking about the golden ages, you know, what kicked it off was Street Fighter 2 and in the same year Fatal Fury came out. Now we're gonna have a new Fatal Fury coming up and it feels like, you know, all the big dogs are there already. We know a Virtu Virtua Fighter is in the works. That's something that they've mentioned. Uh, we haven't, like, gotten an announcement of it, but they've shown these revivals of Sega franchises and they've mentioned, you know, yeah, Virtua Fighter is what we want to work on. And uh, kind of the preamble for that was the... Uh, re uh, release of the remake for Virtual Fighter 5, you know, new graphics engine and everything. Uh, so mm -hmm. all these old dogs, you know, the old guard that encapsulated the arcade era are going to be here, essentially. And Street Fighter 6, very well received. Tekken 8, good launch. 
a little bit shaky right now. Gonna move up from here, in my opinion. Fatal Fury, the pre-release reception is amazing. Um, we'll see what they do with Virtua Fighter. I'm hoping for the best. I actually really like Virtua Fighter. I think it's a cool series. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens there. And uh, honestly, uh, you know, with how well Dragon Ball Fighters went, I would be surprised if we don't get another one of those. So it's going to be a melding of like the old era and the new era, I think. Uh, and we also have one thing that was absent for quite some time. It's just these random new fighting games popping up from nowhere. We have a Hunter x Hunter fighting game coming for some reason, you know? That wasn't a thing for a while, but back in like the SNS and PS2 days, that was very much a thing where you did like proper fighting games with established IPs. Hmm. Um, not as much of a thing anymore, but now it's apparently becoming a thing again. They did the same thing with DNF Duel because that's like huge in Korea. They, not uh, Duel, but the Dungeon Fighter itself, right? Mm -hmm. So they made something with that, and Grand Blue Fantasy is also that kind of thing, because Grand Blue Fantasy is a huge mobile game, and they just made a fighting game out of it. So I think we're seeing kind of a return to the arcade age in that sense, obviously not in the physical arcades, but in the online space. And we're also seeing that in the games, all of them have virtual arcades in them, right? Mm -hmm. Street Fighter VI, Tekken Eight, Grand Blue Fantasy versus Rising, um, Guild Gear Strive has a very weird one, but essentially an arcade. Um, <laughs> Oh, with the levels and... Yeah, that, uh, that everyone thought was an April Fool's joke. <laughs> and then just doubled out on it. Yeah. Um, so, I think it's essentially combining the original Golden Age that was the Arcade Age, with the second Golden Age that was the Online Age, and being like, here's the Online Arcade. And on top of that, eSports is really big right now, going very well for fighting games, you know. Uh, got a millionaire for Street Fighter VI uh, the other month. So... I think we are in a new golden age, and I think we're going to really be feeling that in about two years. That's when it's really going to sink in, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, let me ask you this final uh, question. Darkest and brightest spots on the timeline? From, from the start until now? Sure. Darkest and brightest, huh? Ooh. That is And there can be little windows. Well, well, just off the top of your head. It doesn't have to be personally. right. The comments will be very nice to you, I'm sure, if you're wrong. Surely. For me personally? Uh, or just no, in general? For, for what you think is like the whole the wholesale okay. brightest time. Okay. And it can be a, a spree, or a, you know, a collection of years. I am a massive arcade fan. So brightest spot for me, even though, you know, I wasn't physically there for it because I didn't have many arcades here. Uh, I go to arcades every time I'm in Japan now. Love the atmosphere, love the whole thing. I think the brightest spot in general was probably when Capcom really pushed arcades to new heights. Around 95, when you have all the stuff, like Street Fighter 2 is still there, right? But you also have like Street Fighter yeah, Alpha, Alpha, and you have uh, Dark Stalkers. You get all these weird games like Cyberbots and stuff like that. And uh, obviously it's not just them, because you also have Virtua Fighter, Tekken, uh, Fatal Fury, King of Fighters 94, all the stuff in the arcades. I think that is probably the brightest spot on the fighting game timeline. Um, I, I think that set the tone, and I think that's reflective in what we're seeing now since they're making the virtual arcades, right? Mm -hmm. They want to hark back, harken back to the arcade age because everyone loved it. As for darkest spots, ooh, hmm. Okay, that's actually something I kind of need to mention, I guess, because I am talking about this being a new golden age. I think it also has a dark blemish on it. And it's... But we said Mortal Kombat 1, yeah. Yeah, not that. Uh, it could turn into a very dark spot, and that is the... the kind of thing that Tekken 8 did here, where it didn't show the microtransactions in during reviews, and then they kind of patched it in later. And I don't think that's a huge deal since it's just cosmetic outfits, but I think it can lead somewhere bad. So I think this kind of microtransaction stuff, I think uh, Street Fighter VI's microtransactions are insane to me. Uh, like the avatar costumes and what they cost. I think that's absolutely crazy. Uh, yeah. So that kind of stuff, I don't need to buy it, so it doesn't affect me. And I think that's the mentality a lot of people kind of... Um, but it sows Same. bad will. It yes. feels like a negative relationship with yeah. the developers, with the game even. I think that kind of stuff can lead to very bad places. And I think 
Street Fighter Cross Tekken is another game that needs to come up here because they had on disc DLC. That's a big mm -hmm. reason why gems, the game, baby. big reason why the game crashed, uh, in my opinion. Even though the gameplay was kind of not great at the start, I think people would have stuck around for the second version if it wasn't for twelve essentially completed characters being on disc, and then you know, oh yeah, a year from now you can pay this much and you'll get them. But they were essentially already done. Um, it's not about DLC itself because I think DLC makes sense. You need to do it in today's landscape because game development is more expensive and keeping yeah, the online but do it where expensive. i'm do it so that i'm not feeling like i'm getting ripped off or that like it make it so that one i want to get this you know yeah. like a new game like like a new south park game just came out like i it may it's got kind of crappy reviews but like i'm happy to as a huge south park fan like i'm happy to to you know jump in and if it's bad i won't keep you know buying dlc and stuff but like like I, i'm i'm there to support and i'll play the game and everything and like yeah. i and i have a relationship with this where i'm like i think that these guys are going to do right by me and, and and whatnot but when it feels like if like you know they they turn it into the dlc burger and you got to buy everything and it feels like you're just trying to use me as a tool and we don't have like a relationship as developer and fan and it only only if money is the only thing that you care about in all of this then that's going to turn me off in, in a huge way yeah and uh it, so so like when i i'll go in and i'll put money into something that i especially if i like an artist you know like it's the whole for those of you that are old enough to remember cds and whatnot go buy the cd even though you could just go on you know <laughs> limewire and download it because you want to support the artist because you like them right yeah. um if you have that relationship with your fans because you're producing good content and you're producing stuff that like i actually want to buy and not ed as a DLC character, uh, then I'm I'm down to you know continue my my support and everything. But when it feels like you're just you know not telling me who's coming, like remember that from Street Fighter Five? It's like a bunch of mystery characters. Buy the season pass now, and then you'll get them later. And it's like, what are you doing? And how are you not communicating? Let me tell you my darkest spot. And I don't know that this is necessarily the darkest, but since we're going kind of personal with this, uh -huh. the spree from like we talked about cross Tekken into Street Fighter Five into Marvel versus Capcom infinite the, the things were still going well and and even just capcom kept its head above water but the amount that was lost and the amount of momentum that was before that that kind of got squandered uh, i feel like if you're just looking at how much was lost that might be the darkest period because of what could have been and because of so many missteps all in a row and some of them build upon each other but that was that was like we shot up to the moon and then found a staircase and fell down and we had a really long way to fall so yeah. it was okay but we fell freaking far with yeah. all that and it was it was more than just crappy gameplay it was terrible practices with communication between developers and communities and uh and like they just begat more negative feelings and then you know pro tours were handled i mean the, 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 i don't want to go into pro tours because they were kind of emerging and you kind of give a little bit of leeway and and, and, and some buffer room because they're figuring things out but they were making mistakes that they should have, like anti-air jabs in street fighter 5 like how is that something that's okay once you've had 30 years to know that anti-air jabs are not a good thing and all of the other stuff and the input lag it's like that would be acceptable to a much greater degree early on you know if it was like street fighter 2 days like street fighter 2 is broken as all hell people don't care about that it's like because it came out when it did sure it's this late in the process and and now you're just you're just oh so i feel like the loss there or the or the downward trend was very very significant there I, I feel like you've been holding that in for a bit. I've been trying to sneak it into videos and sneak it into articles <laughs> best I can. But yeah, it feels good to just say I'm going to cry after this. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I agree. Uh, I do. Uh, I don't think I was as emotionally invested because I've always been spread a bit more wide than like putting all my eggs in the Capcom basket uh, as far as like what I play. Right. Mm hmm. But I agree. Yeah, I, I mean, I felt all that too. I, obviously, uh, I was a huge fan of Marvel vs. Capcom Free, so seeing Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite was heartbreaking to me. Uh, what, what they, what, what that ended up being. So I definitely agree with that. And you know, yeah, the tumble was big, uh, kind of rising now. But when you think about a world where that rise didn't have to happen because you didn't fall in the first place, uh, yeah. yeah, I get it. Did you did you exactly specify where you thought the darkest time was? Um, I think it might be coming, uh, depending on you know what happens here. Because uh, I think we're in a golden age, but that's me being optimistic. Because this kind of stuff 
like with the transactions and everything could be really that 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 could turn really ugly real fast uh so that's kind of but if we're talking about something that isn't speculative if we're talking about something more like yeah you know this thing actually happened um I'm not sure I feel as strongly about it as you, but I'd probably say the same. Uh, I think Marvel's Capcom Infinite in particular, really. That was a hard blow. Because Marvel's Capcom 3 was such a huge hit. And, you know, so many friends of mine who weren't even into fighting games watched that game. Uh, mm. So when it was like, oh, a new Marvel is coming, everyone was super hyped. And then it was just not it in any sense. Like, no nothing about it really gelled with what people liked about Marvel's Capcom 3. Uh, I've heard people say the gameplay is fine. Uh... I disagree, but if if they think so, that's great, right? But I think everyone can agree that like on every other area, they messed it up. Even if the gameplay is fine, everything else is kind of not. All right. Was there anything else you wanted to tack on to all this? Yeah, uh, one more thing actually, because uh, you you went in kind of personal on this one, uh, so I gave my objective view of what I think was the like brightest spot and what could potentially be the darkest spot so i'm just going to give a subjective view on what was the brightest spot for me personally as well mm -hmm. uh snk coming back to glory uh sam show king of fighters 14 was also like it was a good game but it wasn't like amazing uh king of fighters 14 was sweet sam show kof 15 now the new fatal fury coming out i'm a huge snk fan uh seeing this is just absolutely amazing to me and you know um our colleague dakota dark horse he went to the snk world championship finals and he did an interview with oda-san uh you know who's in charge of uh, well most snk projects right now finding in projects anyway he was a producer on uh, i believe he was the director for kof 14 and sam show and he's producer on kof 15 and uh the new fatal fury i believe Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, you know. But I believe that's uh, his official title. And I actually uh, slipped the Coda message from me uh, in Japanese to give to Oda uh, about how much I love SNK and, you know, what it means to me. Um, this whole spiel of, you know, uh, when I went to an arcade when I was a kid, you know, I just got drawn to King of Fighters, which is true. Like, I'm not making anything up. And... I still have like etched in my memory seeing Terry Bogard and I was like, this is the coolest character, man. Uh, so it was like this, this, it wasn't that long, but it was like a whole thing about how much SNK means to me. You know, now I've uh, posted results in Sam's show uh, as a competitor and uh, I've made friends across the world thanks to King of Fighters. O other fighting games as well, of course, but you know, that was still the core for me. And uh, just, you know, how great they are to me and that I think, even with all the fighting games that I've played and worked with, SNK's characters just have a different type of charm to them. Uh, so Dakota did deliver this message. He showed him, you know, and he could read it. And uh, I was told that all he said was, I'm very happy. So, hey, that's that's high praise. Yeah, so that was great. Uh, I, I imagine someone like Oda being very stoic. So saying something as yeah. far as, I'm very happy, is showing a lot. Yeah, so that is... Uh, for me personally, that would be like the bright spot seeing SNK come back. And I'm very glad I was able to express that as well, even not in person, but still, you know, for a personal message. So that, that felt awesome. All right. Well, Nick, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your, your expertise. Someone who's very passionate about fighting games and has been for a long time and has been paying attention. You know, I've, I've been around for, you know, a good 10, 15 years now, but there's a lot of times where I'll have to go to Nick or, or to uh, Catalyst who've been paying attention for much longer than I have and ask, like, what happened here? What happened there? He's always yeah. a good resource for that. <laughs> Plus the Japanese translations. Nick, you are a uh, you are a gem. Really appreciate you. Thank you. I do my best. Um, thanks for having me on. It's always a great time, you know, shooting the shit with you. Please don't swear. All right. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>